Hey there eco nerdlings! Today we're going to be discussing water pollution and human impact. So water pollution is the addition of any substance that degrades or lowers the quality of the water from living organisms. So looking at this, going back to our case study, the Salton Sea has seen a large amount of nutrient pollution from excess fertilizers that have run off from nearby farms. So as all of those fertilizers run off from the farms, they get put into the little streams and rivers and eventually make their ways to larger bodies of water, such as the Salton Sea. So the excess nutrient pollution causes eutrophication or an overgrowth of algae. Algae blooms caused by eutrophication actually block the sunlight out from reaching other underwater plants. So other underwater plants will die. Also, those underwater plants death as well as um, all of the algae that are blooming decrease the dissolved oxygen content of the water. When the dissolved oxygen content of the water is lowered, larger animals such as all of the different types of fish are going to die because they're not going to be able to get enough oxygen. They actually suffocate to death. So looking down here, this is a photo. This is actually a boat moving through a 2011 algal bloom in Lake Erie. So dissolved oxygen levels can also plummet with the amount of oxygen consumed by bacterial decomposers in the water or when those suddenly increase. And that's called the biological oxygen demand or BOD. This tends to happen from an influx of food such as raw sewage or dead algae. So if we have an overflow of sewage and it goes into the water, again, the dissolved oxygen content can plummet because of the algal blooms. They get really excited uh, or the bacteria get really excited and they use up all of the oxygen and they don't leave enough for other species of animals. So there are different types of water pollution. We have fertilizer runoff, which is an example of non-point source pollution. Make sure you know the difference between non-point source pollution and point source pollution. So our non-point source uh, pollution, because it doesn't come from a single point, whenever we have fertilizer runoff, it's coming from a bunch of different points in that area and then running off into a source. We also have raw sewage. This is an example of a point source pollution. So if we have raw sewage coming out of a pipe like right here, that's coming from a single point going into a water source. So non-point sources of pollution can enter a body of water from anywhere across its watershed. And remember, the watershed goes from a higher elevation to a lower elevation, and it collects all of those uh, pollutants, nitrates, phosphates, sediments as it goes until it eventually drains into a huge uh, watershed area like the mouth of the Mississippi right here. So we actually have a Clean Water Act, and that was established because of the Industrial Revolution. So at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and continuing into the 1960s, water pollution was basically just kind of seen as a side effect of the Industrial Revolution itself, something we just had to live with. However, in 1969, the Chuahoga River in Ohio was so polluted with oil on its surface that it actually caught on fire. Then officials kind of thought to themselves, hmm, maybe we should do something about this. And they did. So they actually had articles in the Time magazine as well as National Geographic that spurred this mov uh, movement that gave birth to the first water pollution laws. So by 1972, about two thirds of the United States lakes, rivers and coastal waters were actually unsafe for swimming and fishing. Finally, the Clean Water Act was passed in 1977, and this is a law that set the allowable limits for various pollutants in its surface waters. So any point source may not be discharged uh, pollution onto the surface waters without a permit. States are required to develop lists of impaired waters that are too polluted or degraded to meet water quality standards, so people know where they need to stay away from, where they can't go swimming, and where they also can't eat fish out of. So looking at this, this is a large number of surface waters in the United States that are actually still considered to be impaired. So right here, this is showing the leading causes of impaired waters. So basically what made that water impaired so we can't swim in it or we can't eat fish out of it. So number one, we have pathogens such as bacteria and parasites that can cause disease 
Some of those can come from sewage contamination in the waters uh, as well as runoff. We have metals such as mercury, and a lot of times uh, you might hear in the news about mercury poisoning or bioaccumulation of mercury in food chains and food webs in the, in the uh, lakes and rivers and oceans. We also have nutrient pollution from fertilizer runoff. Those are your nitrates, uh, your phosphates. We have oxygen depleting pollution such as raw sewage that causes those algal blooms. We have uh, PCBs. These are synthetic chemicals that were actually found to be mutagenic, meaning that it can mutate our DNA and cause different things such as cancer, uh, unchecked cell growth. And it was banned in 1979. But just because it was banned in 1979, unfortunately, that doesn't mean that it's not still in some of our water food chains. We also have sediment pollution from soil erosion. We have acid pollution, which actually lowers the pH of waters. And then we also have pesticide runoff. So this chart right here is a guide to Lake Michigan uh, fish that shows the persistence of PCBs pollution and its biomagnification in the food chain. Basically, this is telling you what you can and cannot eat because of the level of PCBs that's going to be in those different types of fish. So it's letting you know that, for example, right here in all waters, if the fish is less than 32 inches, you can eat it once a month safely. If it's larger than 32 inches, you can eat it once every other month safely. Uh, some of them, if you look over here, the channel catfish, if you catch it, it says absolutely do not eat because it's so contaminated with the PCBs. Uh, same thing for larger leak trout. It tells you right here that you can't eat it because it's contaminated with PCBs due to biomagnification. So typically the larger the fish, the more toxins are gonna be in that fish if it's in an area that was exposed to some type of toxin. So ocean pollution, the majority of pollution in the ocean falls into two categories, one, oil, and two, petroleum-based plastics. So the biggest sources of oil in the ocean include natural seeps from oil deposits in the ocean floor. They also include runoff from land, which includes leaking cars and improper disposal and used uh, motor oil. This is unfortunately the largest source. Uh, we also have discharges from ships. We have spills from offshore drilling. We have spills from oil tankers and accidents. We also have uh, the oil that actually gets into the oceans. The oil penetrates the fur and feathers of animals and it destroys their natural insulation. So a lot of those animals will actually die of hypothermia because they get so cold. It destroys their insulation. A lot of times they'll also poison themselves because you know they're sitting there trying to lick all of this oil off and clean themselves. So a lot of times they'll poison themselves as well. Oil also directly damages the tissues of fish as well as other, other aquatic organisms that become coated in it. So although oil spills from rigs and tanker ships are not the biggest source of oil in the ocean, they have the most severe side effects in the immediate area. So one of the worst spills that ever happened in North America was called the Exxon Valdez, and that happened in 1989. Because of this oil spill, we actually came up with different types of laws. So when the Exxon Valdez ran aground in Alaska, a very, very large volume, uh, volume of oil was spilled. And the damage was worsened by a series of other factors. First of all, it was way up in Alaska, so it was very, very remote, and there wasn't a lot of people around to begin cleaning up the oil spill. So the remoteness of it and the location of it made it very hard to get to right away. And that caused a delayed cleanup or a response due to the lack of preparation by the oil companies themselves. They didn't really have a team ready to deploy if an oil spill occurred. So like I said, because of that, we actually came up with the Oil Pollution Act of 1990. And the following changes were made. So first of all, operators of oil tankers were responsible for all of the cleanup costs. And they also increased the maximum liability for losses by businesses and private individuals. They phased out the single hulled tankers in favor of double hulled tankers. So looking right here, if you have two hulls and one of them has damage, only that one's going to have a spill. Whereas before, they would just be contained in the same area. So if there was a leak, all of it would come out. So that double hull reduces the losses in an oil spill by about four to six times. So we have the worst oil spill by volume occurred in 2010 when an oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico experienced a blowout. 
So the drilled well was at the bottom of the sea and it gushed nearly 5 million barrels of oil into the sea over a period of four months before we could stop it. Another huge uh, pollution factor in the oceans is plastic. And a study done by the Environmental Investigation Agency revealed that whales in the ocean were ingesting large amounts of plastic as well as fishing gear. So this right here is a gray whale. Uh, this gray whale actually stranded near Seattle and it was found to have all of the following in its stomach. So first of all, uh, gray whales, if you look here, they're called baleen feeders. So they have these long teeth that are actually made out of keratin or protein, kind of like your hair. And their whole purpose, they're filter feeders. So they take in these huge gulps of water and then they force all of the water out through their teeth and then they'll swallow all of the solid particulates that are left over. So typically they're trying to go for krill and things like that. Well, unfortunately, when this guy was feeding, he would take in a huge gulp of water, filter out, you know, squeeze all of the water out through his teeth or his baleen and this is what he ingested, sweatpants, duct tape, surgical gloves, golf balls, and more than 20 plastic bags. So obviously all of those caused this whale to die because he had consumed so many different types of toxins produced by us that we basically just dumped into the oceans. Uh, this is another example of uh, plastic uh, harming marine mammals. So we have a seal right here that had plastic wrapped around its nose. And each year, plastic items dumped from ships and left as litter on beaches, they threaten marine life everywhere. Uh, one of the hugest things are the little uh, Coke pack containers, little six pack plastic Coke pack containers. Uh, those can get wrapped around limbs, they can get wrapped around necks, they can be swallowed. Uh, lots of damage can be caused by those. And plastic is non-degradable, meaning that it doesn't break down or decompose in the environment like other substances do. So an exposure to sunlight will actually cause plastic to become brittle and it breaks apart into smaller pieces. All of these smaller pieces accumulate in systems of rotating ocean currents called gyres. So the largest collection of plastic pollution in the ocean is in the Great Pacific Trash Vortex and this is located in the South Pacific Gyre. So right here we have a sample of the plastic and fishing gear caught by filmmakers on the Garbage Island documentary. Most of the plastic is small and suspended below the surface. And the mass of the plastic pieces sampled from this area is six times greater than the plankton biomass. We also have fishing problems because we're overfishing our oceans. So we have a major decline in the worldwide catch of fish since 1990 is because of overfishing. We have a lot of bycatch, meaning we're catching different types of organisms, whether they're other species of fish or whether they're marine mammals or sea turtles or birds that we're not fishing for, but unfortunately they get trapped in the nets and we call that bycatch. So we have overfishing and extinction. So about 75% of the world's commercially valuable marine fish species are overfished or they're fished near to their sustainable limits. So big fish are becoming very scarce. I know earlier this year we watched a film and uh, it was talking about the fish size in Jamaica and that the fish size used to be a lot larger and now all of the fish in Jamaica are smaller because those are the only fish left over for them to catch and sell at the meat markets. So we have smaller fish that are next. So now even though we uh, got rid of all of the big fish because we overfished, now we're overfishing our small fish. And we actually throw away about 30% of the fish that we catch. We needlessly kill sea mammals, marine birds, sea turtles, as far as bycatch. So these are some of the different types of nets that are deployed. We have fish farming in a cage, and then we have a trawl flap and trawl lines right here. We have sonar per seine fishing right here. Uh, we have drift net fishing. Uh, we have gill nets. We have deep sea aquaculture cages. And we also have long lines. These are one of the most debated uh, types of fishing are the long lines as well as our uh, trawls and our gill nets. So these are some of the examples of purse scenes. So they basically, this whole purse, and you know, you have like a string. So when you pull the string, the purse closes. So open, and then we pull the string, and it closes, and it entraps all of these fish. This is the type of net we typically use to catch tuna. 
So purse sand, basically, like I was saying, it's like a large purse net and it's put into the ocean and then it's closed like a drawstring purse to trap those fish. Tuna, again, is the fish that we typically catch in purse stains. Dolphins are a huge bycatch that happen when we're using these purse stains. So a lot of times if you go to the store now, you'll see dolphin safe tuna. Just because it says dolphin safe tuna doesn't mean that dolphins weren't a part of the bycatch. It just means that they have a specialized net that they try to exclude dolphins from. But we do still have some dolphins that are caught as bycatch. Long line fishing, these are when lines are put out and they can be up to 80 miles long with thousands of baited hooks on them. So these are left out and free floating for days and then the boat will come back and pick them up. We have a ton of different types of organisms that get caught up in these. We have pilot whales, dolphins, different types of sea turtles, lots of types of seabirds, and those are all bycatch of this technique. And then we have drift netting. So each drift net hangs as much as 50 feet below the surface and up to 35, 34 miles long. So basically, you know, very, very deep, very, very long. Anything that swims into this is going to get caught by that invisible net and entangled. And especially anything with gills are going to get stuck in it. You know, marine mammal flippers, tails, uh, turtle flippers, tails, heads can get stuck in these nets. And they, again, can be caught as bycatch and killed. And this leads again to overfishing. And many unwanted fish and marine mammals, as well as turtles and birds, are caught into these drift nets. So right here, this is kind of a before and an after picture of a net. So this is an area of the ocean before and after a trawler net was deployed. And it basically acted like a giant plow and scraped pretty much everything off of the area. So I hope that was kind of some food for thought about some of the impacts that we have on the ocean as far as trash and overfishing, some of the problems that you guys are going to have to deal with in the future. Well, if you'd like to rewatch this video or any other AP Environmental Science videos, you can go to my website at www.nerdlingscience.com. Well, this is the Queen Nerdling signing off for now. Stay nerdy until next time.